Good evening, my name is Leandra Clark and I am a doctoral student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm at the ABCI 40th convention and I have the honor and the privilege of interviewing Dr. Kevin Coakley. Dr. Coakley, I want to start off by asking you about your background. Tell me a little bit about it, where you're from, where you grew up. Well, I am from a small rural town called Pilot Mountain, North Carolina, population okay. approximately 3,500. Wow. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Very, very rural area, very few African Americans. Mm -hmm. um, not, you know, it was an area that I used to be ashamed of growing up mm -hmm. because I would be teased mercilessly. Um, if you're familiar with the Andy Griffith show, yeah. Mount Pilot, that sort of thing. Oh, okay. All right. And so tell me about your family. I am the oldest of five. Um, the Four, um, I have three brothers and one sister. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have both of my parents still alive. Mm -hmm. And um, we have extended family in Mississippi, uh, Louisiana, Georgia, and Virginia. Mm -hmm. And um, a very big family. Good. So the area in which you grew up, did you also do most of your schooling in that area? Or? I attended... Um, High school in Pilot Mountain, North Carolina. Okay. I, I received my bachelor's degree in psychology from Wake Forest University okay. in Winston Salem, North Carolina. I uh, received my master's degree in counseling from the University of North Carolina Greensboro, and I received my PhD in counseling psychology from Georgia State University in Atlanta, Georgia. Wow! So you finally did break out of that town and get to some other places, yes. huh? My goodness. So I'm interested in hearing about um, some of the early influences on you um, as far as uh, education, some of the messages you got and where you got them from. <clears throat> well, you know, I growing up in the, the area that I um, did, mm -hmm. there weren't many, first of all, there weren't many African Americans where we lived. Right. And in the high schools and the elementary schools and all the schools that we um, went to, there weren't many African American students, and certainly there weren't many African American students who were in the so-called gifted classes or okay. uh, the accelerated classes. Mm -hmm. And so I often, t I usually found myself being the only African American student in those classes. And so for me, that created this idea that I was somehow special, or that African Americans, you know, generally did not achieve highly, and that that I was mm -hmm. exceptional. Okay. And that really changed um, upon attending a summer enrichment program at Wake Forest University. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a program designed to get more African Americans and other ethnic minorities in the field of medicine. Mm -hmm. And once I experienced that, it was two weeks at on the campus of Wake Forest University. Um, the program was called Medicine as a Career. Hmm. And I saw African American students from all across the state of North Carolina, um, uh, most of whom, or many of whom were uh, from relatively impoverished backgrounds, mm -hmm. you know, similar to myself, but all haven't been identified as, as being very uh, bright students. And for me, that did more for my self-concept at that time than anything else could have because I realized that, yes, while I was a, certainly a strong student, I was not necessarily exceptional, but there were other African-American students across the entire mm -hmm. state who were equally, if not more talented than myself. And that was a message that I needed at that particular time in my mm -hmm. life. And I followed that up by attending a five-week summer program called Focus on Biology, also on the campus of Wake Forest University. Okay. And again, it just sort of solidified for me that I wanted to pursue higher education and I wanted to be in a place where I could um, develop more friends and meet more people who, who were like me. Wow. That's really an, an interesting progression and kind of thought and thought about yourself. Um, from feeling exceptional to feeling challenged, but really rising to that challenge and yeah. um, meeting it, it sounds yeah. like, and as we know, exceeding it, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so what sparked your interest in psychology? Why psychology? You, you said you went to this biology um, summer kind of institute. Yes. And well, I, I think I probably had an experience similar to many other students. It probably was freshman chemistry and biology. <laughs> a very common story. So okay. um, they were very challenging <laughs> classes. And, um, and I also took Latin and, and psychology. Okay. And um, I did, you know, relatively well in my psychology class. And so I, you know, had a, a rethinking of my career goals. And, and, and more, I think more importantly, I, I had an opportunity to work in a summer program as a counselor. Uh, and it was in a program similar to the program that I had participated in. And I realized probably at that time, and this happened I think during my sophomore and junior years, that 
this was something that perhaps I, I needed to pursue, um, something related to the health and professions, mm -hmm. counseling. And so, but I, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do or what form it would take, but I knew that it would have something to do with the health and professions. So that was probably the, the first realization that I had that I was going to go into counseling or psychology. Hmm. Um, but again, because I, I got up, and I have a story that I've been very open about where I, I struggled academically mm -hmm. um, for, you know, the first, certainly the first couple of years. And it wasn't clear to me that I was going to even be able to go to graduate school. And I was, I was really blessed. It was, it was really a rather serendipitous uh, moment when I came across uh, a young man who was in, in the fraternity that I'm a part of. And he happened to be from another campus, and he asked me what I was um, going to be doing, you know, with my life because I, because I was a senior, and I really had no idea. Hmm. He informed me that he was going into a master's program in counseling, and I had never heard of such an option. I was under the impression that you could only go to doctor programs in clinical psychology, and didn't think that I would be particularly competitive for that. So he told me about this master's program in counseling. I, I looked into it. And I realized that this was something that I I could be competitive for and, and would possibly be able to you know uh, get accepted in. So I applied to a couple of programs, um, one being the University of North Carolina Greensboro, which had at that time I think the top ranked counseling program in the country, uh, the other being Appalachian State University. And I was accepted in both and chose to go to the University of North Carolina Greensboro. And, and interestingly enough, my initial career goal was to be what they called at that time a director of minority affairs hmm. uh, because of the individual who uh, at that time was, had been relatively influential in my life, um, Dr. Ernie Wade, who, okay. who was a counselor psychologist and who was the director of the minority affairs office. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought that that's the, the career that I would pursue. That changed um, after my first semester, or actually my first year in the counseling program, where after I, I read people like doc, Dr. Thomas Parham, Dr. Janet Helms, Dr. Daryl Wing Su, mm -hmm. and I really liked the fact that they were so direct in talking about race and racial identity, and I saw the common denominator being that they were all counseling psychologists, and it was at that point that I had a career shift, mm -hmm. um, or I had a, a change in sort of goals, and decided that I wanted to pursue my uh, doctorate in counseling psychology, and it was after attending a, a, a conference at the, at the American Counseling Association in Atlanta, Georgia, where I met Dr. Thomas Parham, and I was really sort of overwhelmed and, and, and just sort of overcome with the emotion of seeing him and seeing other counselors of color. And he informed me that, you know, if you think this is an impressive gathering, you need to attend the Association of Black Psychologists. Yeah. And I said, where do I sign up? Where do I go? Right. How, do I, how do I become a part of this? And so it was at that moment that I first found out about the Association of Black Psychologists. And then after mm -hmm. I was accepted into a doctor program in counseling psychology, I ended up um, becoming um, a member. Wow, wow. So before we get to ABCI, I'm interested in hearing about your experiences as a graduate student. Okay. Um, what was that like before, you know, this wonderful organization into your <laughs> life? You know, I, I was always someone who was deeply interested in um, history, the history and culture of, of our people. And I knew, you know, I knew that I wanted to do something that would allow me to to further pursue that interest. Mm -hmm. Didn't know exactly what form it would take, but it was something that I was very passionate about. And even in my doctoral program, you would you would see me walking through classes, uh, reading maybe the autobiography of Malcolm X, mm -hmm. or or reading the Souls of Black Folk, or, mm -hmm. or just or reading something that that allowed me to communicate to my my cohort or, or to my professors that I was a conscious black man, right. um, and and I wanted them to realize that. And so, you know, I, I think that they they were intrigued by that because they really had not, it's ironic being in Atlanta, you would think that they would have that, you know, they would have had that experience more than they had, but um, I think I was intriguing to them. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I always felt the need to express my, my blackness, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, for the most part, it, I, it didn't get me into much trouble. <laughs> so did you feel like your environment was supportive or there were people along the way that were very like mentored you or supported you? Well, I guess the other critical part of the story is that I, I chose to go to Georgia State University in large part because of Baba Asa Hilliard. Mm. And um, when I realized that he was there and I had already, I was already familiar with his work, I wanted to be in a place where I would, I could have access to him. 
And so even though I wasn't in his field directly, he was an educational psychologist by trade, uh, by education, I was still physically located in the same building that he was in. So I would periodically go to his office and you would hear this story about Baba Asa uh, from anyone that you, who's ever encountered it or interacted with him. You would go to his office and he would pull out files of papers or books informing you that you needed to read um, these articles, these publications, these, these books, uh, and you would leave his office bogged down with, with all of this reading material. In fact, I have to this day a file that I refer to as the Hilliard file. Wow. And, the, and they were papers that I collected over the years. Every time I went to his office, papers that were really instrumental in my continued sort of um, growth in, in, in consciousness. Wow. So, so even though he wasn't, you know, formerly a, a member of the Council of Psychology faculty, he was my intellectual mentor, right. and I owe everything I think that I became in terms of sort of my consciousness. I really owe to that man. Wow, that's amazing, amazing. So, tell me about when ABCI entered the picture. Was that with your connection with Dr. Parham, or? Well, uh, ABCI came into the picture formally once I uh, became a first year doctoral student. And I attended my first convention in mm -hmm. Philadelphia. I think it was 1993, 1994. And of course, after I had already made connections with Baba Asa, I knew that, and I had to attend the Association of Black Psychologists. And mm -hmm. um, people may remember that my first convention, I came in wearing a, a three-piece suit, <laughs> and you know, I had, you know, it was my first, my second professional conference. And so when I when I, once I got there, I again I was overwhelmed seeing all these black psychologists, you know, wearing you know African regalia and dashikis, and it was something that I had not expected. And I, I but I felt a connection, and I knew that I wanted to be a part of this this body of uh, what I believe you know believe to be just a, a very impressive group of, of black psychologists, mm -hmm. and that that experience more than any other professional experience, I think, captured my heart. Um, mm -hmm. And I and I made a vow, actually, the first conference that I attended, because I had submitted a paper for the, at that time they had, I think, an award ceremony, like a student scholarship mm -hmm. or a student paper competition. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Sean Yutzi um, received, received the first place award, and I received the second place award. And when I accepted my award, I remember saying to the body of psychologists, you know, because I was so overwhelmed that I would never miss a, a conference, an ABC conference, um, you know, God willing. And and I and I said that with the emotion and perhaps a little bit of naivety, but I, I meant it. And I can honestly say that with the exception of one conference, um, I have not missed any. Wow. Wow, that's really testament to how important ABC has been to you. Yes. Wow. So tell me more about your involvement in ABC past, you know, being exposed to it as a student. Um, where did you go from there? Well, um, I quickly became involved um, in what was called at that time the student division, okay. um, the name preceding the student circle, and I became one of the first uh, student division presidents, mm -hmm. uh, or chairpersons they may have called it at the time. Um, people, I, I guess, saw in me someone who they felt was very enthusiastic, had a lot of energy, and as they decide, you know, oftentimes does, they tend to identify those individuals and put them to work right, right away. And so I became involved, uh, certainly through the student division, and became involved in the local Atlanta ABC chapter where I, I served as the chapter secretary for a year um, and was very involved at the local level. Mm -hmm. And in terms of my entire sort of um, experience at ABC, I, I've been involved at many different levels. Um, I have served as, most recently serving as the Midwest Regional Representative mm -hmm. for three years. Um, I was unable to fulfill my fourth year because I moved out of the Midwest region into the um, South, but um, I, I did that. I, of course, have been um, involved on the uh, editorial board of the Journal of Black Psychology, starting initially as an ad hoc reviewer, uh, working my way to an editorial board member, uh, from there um, progressing to the associate editor position, wow. and uh, as of this conference, becoming um, the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Black Psychology. Congratulations. And, and, and for me, that it really is a testament to, I think, the opportunities that I've had, the nurturing and the growth that, that I've experienced in the Association of Black Psychologists. Mm -hmm. um, I've also had opportunities to write position papers on behalf of the Association. Uh, I wrote a position paper uh, addressing Bill Cosby's sort of mm. um, 
comments that he made um, mm -hmm. a few years ago. I wrote a position paper um, addressing um, Hurricane Katrina and its mm -hmm. impact on our people. Um, I've all, uh, I have all, also had the opportunity to conduct a membership survey on behalf of the mm -hmm. General Assembly. Um, so I, I've made it a point of really becoming active um, and contributing as much as I, as I can um, to the association. Wow. <laughs> That's tremendous. You've done a lot of work. Um, and as I reflect on, on some of the things that you've said about your work and your, your tenure here in ABCI, um, it makes me wonder how you um, really translate some of those messages and some of those lessons to the students that you jagna. Mm -hmm. Well, what I, and I think if you will, if you sort of use this conference um, as an example, I have brought five undergraduate students to the conference with me. Mm -hmm. And, and in the past, I've had opportunities to bring students, uh, both undergraduate and graduate students, because I realized how important it was to me to have that experience and that connection. And my belief has always been, if you get individuals early enough in their development, get them connected to the AV side, mm -hmm. um, it will make, it will leave an emotional imprint that mm -hmm. I think will carry them through and help them to become really dedicated to the organization. Right. And so, because I know that happened to me, I know that it's happened to other individuals who are, you know, in my generation. And so I've always been very committed to making sure that that happens with the students that I work with and that, that, and that I teach. And so that really has been the reason why I've been so student-centered and, mm -hmm. and worked so hard to get students to the convention. Wow. Well, that's just amazing. That's so wonderful that you are so dedicated and that you've really passed that on to your students. And so I'm wondering about all your experiences in ABCI. How have they affected kind of your career? Wow. Um, or influence. You know, that's, that is a very, I've never, I've never thought about that question explicitly. Um, my, in terms of my career, I, I would say that um, the way that I think um, my my sort of intellectual orientation, mm -hmm. the you know the my ideological sort of uh, worldview, certainly has been tremendously influenced by my affiliation and, and active sort of membership in the association of black psychologists. Again, I, if, if I go back to Baba Asa Hilliard, mm -hmm. um, my my in fact my entire research program, I would argue, I would say, has been influenced by by sitting at his feet, mm -hmm. uh, metaphorically, just sort of, of wisdom and learning and soaking in everything you know, that I could from him, as well as some of the other elders within the association. Right. And so my my research program, the way that I, in fact, even the classes that I teach, especially my, my African Center, African American Psychology class, all of that is directly related to having been, and being a member of the Association of Black Psychologists. Wow. Wow. So it's heavily influenced your work. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think it would be an overstatement to say that, that everything about who I am professionally, mm. I owe to the Association of Black Psychologists. Mm. Wow. So what are your hopes for the future of ABSI? Looking back on what you've learned and what you've experienced and as you bring new people into the pipeline, mm -hmm. what, what do you hope happens with this organization? My hope for the organization is that we continue to to grow to to fulfill I think the mandate that that we have before us mm -hmm. um, and we've certainly we've come a long way we we reached a lot of milestones 40 years is certainly a milestone that that not everyone frankly believed that we would reach mm -hmm. but here we are yes I, I want to see us live to our potential and we have a tremendous amount of potential. Um, we haven't always met that potential, um, and it's not because of um, a lack of trying, um, but you know, like other organizations, we've had our growing pains. Mm -hmm. And so really my hope is that as, as our elders start to transition out of leadership positions, that, that the younger generation will really sort of um, fulfill their roles and responsibilities and carry the, the organization and take it to the next level. That's certainly what uh, has been sort of bestowed upon me, mm. and that <laughs> is what I will be bestowing upon my students. Um, mm. so it's a never-ending cycle. Yeah.
I'd have to agree with you. And it sounds like, again, that you've done such a wonderful job in keeping people in that pipeline. Um, and so I'd like to specifically know what your advice is for students and early career professionals um, about their trajectory, their... Well, my, my advice, and, and it's, it's less about sort of professional advice, and mm -hmm. it's really more about the connection to the association. And, uh -huh. and I'm, I'm gonna be very honest and, and candid. Um, you know, and certainly in the last you know, two or three years, we've, we've had, you know, some turbulence and we've had uh, some disaffections and, and which has resulted and I think some positive changes for the organization. But it has also resulted in some individuals um, deciding that ABSI was not the professional home for them. And my, my firm belief is that ABSI will only be as strong as we are committed to it. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that anyone, students or professionals, I don't think anyone has the right to be critical of the organization if they have not given their heart and soul to the organization. And, and, and even over the span of a couple of years, we have individuals who have literally given 30, 40, 50 years to the organization. And so who are we you know, to, to give up on the organization or to be critical when we have not given or dedicated our lives to the organization? Hmm. And so if I could really impart anything to students, I would ask them to look at look at our our elders, look at our uh, our past presidents, look at those individuals who have been in the struggle for year, for longer years than they've been alive. Hmm. Understand what they've been through, understand what they sacrificed, so that we could be here, and take advantage of those opportunities. Take advantage of this organization, and if it's not the organization that you want it to be, then make it the organization that you want it to be. Mm -hmm. um, and that would be the message that I would really. Um, lead with those students. Wow. So in closing, I guess I would ask if you could describe in one sentence what ABCI means to you. How could you do that? What would you say? ABCI is, is my family. And like all families, um, we love hard and we <laughs> fight hard. You know, we don't always agree with each other. We don't always like each other sometimes, but at the end of the day, we know that we share a bond that is deeper um, than some of the divisions that you know that may divide us. And we know that we have a mandate um, that's larger than the disagreements that we have. And our mandate, our charge, is the healing of our people. And when we all it, and when when we argue, we should always come back to that charge mm -hmm. and always remember that. And um, that's what has guided me, that is what has kept me um, involved in the organization, and that is what will continue to keep me in the organization. And that would be what I would ask students to, to have guide them mm -hmm. as well. Wow, well that is just an excellent, excellent point and um, enormous mandate, <laughs> but important. Thank you so much for your time, I appreciate it. You're very welcome. This is Leandra Clark. I'm from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm at the ABCI 40th Convention, and I just interviewed Dr. Kevin Coakley. Thank you for tuning in.